Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming for the keynote of Thursday of Splash. And I'm, I'm very happy about this keynote because I think this community has always been sort of interested for in inspirations and ideas from outside of the sort of narrow space of, of computer science. And Onward especially has been sort of inviting people from outside of, of our own field. And I think we're going to continue that tradition today. Um, but I think we've, we've sort of often had speakers who um, presented ideas from, say, architecture or design or literature. And I think this, this keynote is somewhat different in that it's not just sort of giving you one, one particular idea from somewhere else, but the, the way I sort of understand it is that it's giving us a new new way of thinking about what software is and how we do it. So in that sense, I, I sort of feel that it has the potential to really transform the, the way uh, we think about software. And I'm, I'm personally really happy about this because I found that um, a lot of problems that we're facing require this more broader perspective that's not just sort of stuck within our own discipline. So I find this very exciting, and I'm, I'm happy we have Warren Sack with us today. Um, and Warren is a media theorist, software designer, and artist whose work has been exhibited at the SF MoMA, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Walker Art Center, and ZKM Center for Art and Media. Um, he is chair and professor of film and digital media at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And his work explores theories and designs for online public space and public discussion. His field of expertise is social computing, which explores two issues. First, how can the insights of social, critical, cultural, and media theory be applied to software? And second, how can new media be designed to address outstanding social and political issues? Um, the subject of Warren, Warren Sachs' talk will be his recent book, The Software Arts, which has been recently published by MIT Press, where he offers an alternative history of software that traces its route to the step-by-step -step descriptions of how things were made in the workshops of 18th century artists and artisans. He illustrates how software was born of a coupling of the liberal arts and the mechanical arts and argues that the arts are at the heart of computing. Um, dear colleagues, please welcome Warren Sack. Kalimera. I want to thank uh, Yanis for the invitation to speak today, and Thomas and um, Hideheko uh, for offering to chair the session. Uh, I'm, I'm really awestruck by the opportunity to speak here both at the conference where uh, Alan Kay accepted his Turing Award and also um, to speak here in Athens where ancient Greek philosophy was founded. So when, when Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle lived, the written word went from being known by a few to being common to many. And this shift from media to orality, uh, from, from orality to literacy, uh, established a new order on knowledge, and it birthed what we talk about today as the liberal arts. Um, originally logic, rhetoric, grammar, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. So I will be speaking about my new book uh, titled The Software Arts, where I examine the transformation of knowledge and thinking in this contemporary moment when we're shifting from literacy to computing. And I think this is the, the perfect venue for discussing these matters. And I thank you all for, for being here today. So there are, there are two parts to my talk. Um, first, I'm going to provide an overview of my book. Um, and second, I'm going to expand on one chapter of the book in which I narrate a history of programming languages 
that starts in studios and workshops of 18th century artists and artisans. So what I have to share with you today is a work of software studies. About 10 years ago, a group of us um, under the editorial powers of Matthew Fuller at Goldsmiths uh, put together a volume called Software Studies, a Lexicon. Now we have also edited by Matthew, uh, Computational Culture, a Journal of Software Studies. And there's a book series at MIT Press called Software Studies, which Matthew Fuller, Lev Manovich, and Noah Wardrip Fruin, a colleague of mine at UC Santa Cruz, uh, they serve as founding academic editors. So Wardrip Fruin's expressive processing, uh, digital fictions, computer games, and software studies was the inaugural book of the series when it was published in 2009. My book is the latest in the series. The previous book was Annette V's Coding Literacy, How Computer Programming is Changing Writing. And the one prior to that, oops, we lost the screen. Oh, we got it back. <laughs> the one prior to that was Benjamin Bratton's The Stack on Software and Sovereignty. So Software Studies sits at the intersection of media studies and science and technologies on uh, science and technology studies. Unlike some work in adjacent areas, software studies are critical of, but in close dialogue with computer science. And so I'm very happy to be here in dialogue with you today. These characteristics are clear in what is frequently, if anachronistically, invoked as the first work of software studies. Phil Agri published Computation and Human Experience in 1997, and Agri's book is in conversation with STS, Science and Technology Studies, and Philosophy, but it's also a work of computer science. So those of you who know about it, this is, it was, uh, Phil did some really important work in the technical field of planning. So it would be unfair to insist that works in software studies have to be as Phil's was uh, seminal contributions to both computer science and to science, technology, and, and media studies. But in my opinion, one of the distinguishing characteristics of software studies is that it reads texts of computer science closely, but against the grain. And I tried to perform such a reading in my book that was published in April. In my book, this, The Software Arts, first I closely read some seminal work of computer science to uncover its ambiguities and contradictions. Second, I historicize it to find alternatives to current thinking that may have been lost over time. So my book is a study of computing as a technology of language. And I think this is the right conference with so many programming language designers here. Um, and it's an understanding of software and software composition as a language art. The argument is that the foundational ideas and practices of computing come from the arts, specifically from a coupling of the liberal and the mechanical arts. The claim is that software arts is a new name for something that's been ongoing for centuries. The pursuit of methods that provide us the means to invent and interrogate statements that can be or are already widely accepted as statements of connection, equivalence, or identity. So the stakes are threefold, pedagogical, industrial, and epistemological. First, if software is an art, then education needs to change to integrate it into the arts. What do we teach? What do we learn? These are old questions that need to be posed again in a world where basic literacy is not a matter of Latin, Greek, or English, but of software. Second, if software can be written in the manner of an artist humanist, then new avenues of software production beyond engineering and science may be possible. Third, if software is the new lingua franca, 
then there are a series of ethical and moral questions that must be pursued in conjunction with this epistemological transformation. What counts as knowledge? For whom? And at what cost? The software arts are the fruit of a coupling of the liberal and the mechanical arts. And to demonstrate this argument, the approach taken is partly historical. By tracing the genealogy of computing back to events before or during the initial professionalization of science and engineering, it becomes clear that computing, like science and engineering too, grew out of the arts. Prior to the so-called scientific revolution of the 17th century, there were no scientists. There were no professional organizations of science. Most studies that we would now identify as scientific were conducted under the name of natural philosophy. And natural philosophers most frequently published their works in Latin, in which the word scientia meant something broader than the modern cognate science something more like the general term knowledge. The professionalization of engineering occurred even later. At that time and before, education and inquiry were carried out in the mechanical arts and then the liberal arts. The software arts is also a reading of the texts of computing, code, algorithms, and technical papers that emphasizes continuities between prose and programs. Historically, it's possible to say that this position was first sketched out in the 17th century in proposals to develop artificial philosophical languages that were used to knit together the liberal arts of logic, grammar, and rhetoric, the liberal arts of language, and the mechanical arts. For example, those practiced by artisans in workshops producing pins and stockings, locks, guns, and jewelry. When the writings of the mechanical arts were cookbooks, the descriptions were recipes. And when they were not cookbooks, they were how-to manuals with metaphorical recipes to explain step by step how things could be made. The language of the literal and metaphorical recipes, these artificial languages, became what we know today as computer programming languages. The claim is that contemporary artificial languages have shaped and been shaped by the arts and have re-articulated the relationship between the liberal and the mechanical arts, an assembly we currently call art, design, the humanities, and technology. Programming languages are the offspring of an effort to describe the mechanical arts in the languages of the liberal arts. Writing software is a practice of writing akin to the activity of novelists, playwrights, screenwriters, speech writers, essayists, and academics in the arts and the humanities. And consequently, contemporary education, research, industry, and technology development all need to change to better recognize how the arts sit at the center of computing. So while my position might strike some as radical, it's relatively well represented among some of the most influential experts in computing. For example, in an interview describing the first Macintosh, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs said, part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians, poets, and artists, and zoologists, and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. And they brought with them, we all brought to this effort, a very liberal arts attitude. In my book, The Software Arts, I argue that Jobs was right. The arts and the humanities are at the center of computing. Jobs made this declaration about technology and liberal arts not just once, but pretty much at practically every product launch. Jobs is not alone. There are many important computer scientists who have also put the arts and the humanities at the center of computing. For instance, programming language designers are frequent ag advocates of treating computing as a language art educator, designer of the logo programming language and artificial intelligence co-founder Seymour Papert, in his book Mindstorms, wrote about how at the time of Plato, there was no radical split between philosophy and mathematics and how today we need to reintegrate the humanities and the sciences. Papert's comments give us 
give one cause to recall that the traditional liberal arts as studied and practiced in early modern era of Europe included both the trivium, the arts of language, and the quadrivium, the arts of number. And at the time, there was no strict boundary to be drawn between what today we call the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. So with my book, I aim to help erase these boundaries. For each chapter of the book, I have a hope for the reader. So to begin, if the first chapter, the introduction, has worked as I wished, the reader is willing to entertain the possibility that although computing can be seen as a science, for example, computer science, and as engineering, for example, software engineering, it can also be seen as an art or as a collection of arts, the software arts. Chapter two on translation is offered as a methods chapter. Translation is known to the scholar and to the computer scientist, but each is familiar with a very different flavor of it. The main example discussed in the chapter is a set of texts from the beginning of the theory of computation concerning Alan Turing's machines, Alonzo Church's Lambda Calculus, and popularizations of the Church-Turing thesis that claim that there are no limits to what a computer can do. This popularization is not true. Turing's original publication shows definitively that computers do have limits. By reading popularizations of the text of software as a series of translations from the most technical to the most popular, I show how the popular reception of a technical text can result in a fantasy that contradicts the findings of the original publication. My hope is that the reader will see how to reframe a popularization as a series of translations from the technical literature out into the wilds of popular culture and then back again into the technical literature. The methodology presented is an amendment and an extension to actor network theory, also well known in the field of science and technology studies as a sociology of translation. So this contribution to actor network theory, or ANT for short, is the main methodological contribution of the book. In chapter three, entitled Language, I argue that computers are not information technologies, and the operations of computing are not functions of mathematics. To expand on these assertions, I narrate a history of programming languages that starts in the artisans' workshops of 18th century France. I trace a history of the division of labor as it was comprised in these studios and workshops as it was transcribed by the economist Adam Smith in the first chapter of his book, The Wealth of Nations, as Gaspard Prony revised Smith to organize large-scale calculations with human computers for post-revolutionary France, with a very uh, and as Charles Babbage devised a machine to embody Prony's methods in his analytic engine. Ada Lovelace, who used the operations of the analytic engine to write the first computer program in 1843, called this a science of operations and contrasted it with mathematical logic. Lovelace wrote, the science of operations is a science of itself and has its own abstract truth and value. My hope is that through this history, the reader will come to understand the huge gap that separates logic and mathematics from computation and the affinities shared between computation and the kind of work that's accomplished in the arts. I will return to this theme in a few minutes because this is the chapter that I'm going to unfold for you in this talk. In their original form, algorithms, the topics of chapter four, were simply a new way to do arithmetic which arrived in Europe when merchant capitalism was of dominant force. With the rise of industrial capitalism and in today's age of financial linguistics and surveillance capitalism, arithmetic has gone from being economically important to becoming the beating heart of the economy. Concomitant with this rise of arithmetic in commerce and industry 
was its transformation into a hegemonic form of knowledge from a circumscribed liberal art <coughs> where it was one of the quadrivium, the arts of number. <coughs> the arts of number also included geometry, astronomy, and music. So originally spurred by the challenges of mathematics, over the course of the 20th century, mathematicians, linguists, logicians, and economists reduced, reduced huge swaths of intellectual terrain to arithmetic, to calculation in a move called arithmetization. Arithmetization presaged what we now call digitization and convergence. These moves to centralized calculation have been environmental disasters for many fields, as calamitous for thought as monocrop agriculture has been to the earth's air, water, and soil. The hope for this chapter is that the reader, by following a history of the algorithm from early modern Venice to the computer algorithms of today, will be given the means to stop marveling at the power of algorithms and instead begin to think beyond their ideological limits. To do this, one needs to understand their industrial and intellectual forces that have been applied for well over a century to translate the language arts into the liberal art of arithmetic and once understood to reverse these translations. <clears throat> the focus of chapter five is the liberal art of, of logic. The computer as logic story is often told to emphasize the many contributions of the language art of logic to the development of the computer. And I too retell this story, but include two details that are frequently occluded, materiality and history. It complicates the computer as logic story if one admits that computers of today with power supplies, screens and circuits are materially very different than older works of logic printed on paper. Thomas and I were just joking how we can get the, the media set up here. <laughs> um, so material details are usually sidelined in telling of the computer as logic story. Historical specificity is also usually marginalized in the common narrative because logic as it is articulated today in many technical venues is not very old. First order predicate logic is an invention of the 20th century. Consequently, to narrate how logic begat computers becomes too complicated if one acknowledges that logic of yesterday was a completely different animal than the logic of today. By examining a history of logic, the material specificity of logic circuits, and some of the software design techniques of logic programming, my hope is that the reader will gain insights into how one can take a seemingly unitary monolithic technical topic, logic, and break it down into its many disparate parts. There is no such thing as logic with a capital L, only a multitude of logics, all spelled with lowercase letters. The next chapter, chapter six, is on the second art of the trivium, rhetoric. Aristotle tells us that the strongest rhetoric is closely tied to logical demonstration. And this chapter traces a history of rhetorical demonstration. The history of the demo starts in ancient Greece when definitive demonstration was a matter of deduction as practiced in geometry. Euclid's demonstration or deductive demonstration is displaced by inductive demonstration in the 17th century during the scientific revolution. Inductive demonstration, let's call it Robert Boyle's demonstration, was made necessary when arguments begin to be based on empirical data and not just derived from statements taken to be obviously true. Today, arguments are made on the basis of so much data, so-called big data, that no one person could possibly read it all, much less observe its collection. This has necessitated the invention of yet another form of argumentation that I term abductive demonstration, or alternatively, Solmanov's and Kolmogorov's 
demonstration. The latest form of rhetorical demonstration is actually a kind of data compression that is otherwise known as machine learning. My point is concordant with media theorist Jonathan Stern's idea that we should now be concerned with compression rather than representation. <clears throat> One could say that the founding document of contemporary machine learning was Ray Salmanov's 1960 publication, a preliminary report <clears throat> on a general theory of inductive inference. Employing a theorem of Salmanov's paper, Soviet mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov articulated a theory of complexity, and everybody here probably knows, but the Kolmogorov measure of complexity or randomness of a collection of data is the length of the shortest computer program that can generate the data as output. So machine learning algorithms are designed to accept a collection of data and then search the space of computer programs to find the shortest one which is applicable. And we're meant to believe that big data d sets are aptly characterized by the outputs produced by machine learning algorithms. But we have no way of checking the data. So I call this an abductive demonstration because philosopher Charles Peirce who first articulated abduction in its contemporary sense, and who also invented the um, Boolean circuit here in 1886. I'm showing a letter where he's, he invents it 50 years before Claude Shannon claimed to have invented it. Um, Charles Peirce, uh, his notion of abduction is a form of guessing, or we might say abduction is a form of interpretation a practice well known to the arts and the humanities. The chapter proceeds from older means of making a point to the newest form of persuasion, and I hope the reader will uh, provide, I hope to provide the reader with ways to both question and compose software-based arguments. The penultimate chapter is on the third of the three liberal arts of, of language, specifically grammar. For a long time, grammar was a political project prosecuted as pedagogy in order to homogenize written and spoken language of empires, and then later deployed in an analogous manner to consolidate nation states. Grammar was predominantly prescriptive. Then in the late 19th and early 20th century, grammar was reframed by linguists desiring to describe how language is actually used. With linguistic and uh, with linguist and semiotician Ferdinand de Saussure, grammar became descriptive, and when it did, its locus moved from textbooks into machines, both mechanical and imagined mechanisms of the brain. By the mid 20th century, linguists had joined forces with the mathematical formalism championed by David Hilbert. This resulted in a transformation of linguistics to exclude meaning from its object of study. In the words of Noam Chomsky, quote, the study of meaning and reference and the use of language should be excluded from the field of linguistics. Instead, Chomsky and his followers pursued what they call linguistics in the form of meaningless syntactic manipulations using a, form <coughs> a formalism tantamount to software. After Chomsky, grammar machines had become software and claims were made that software could constitute a theory of language. And this represents a huge shift in intellectual culture. When a computer program, a piece of software, can be a theory, we have entered into what I call the computational episteme. In a computational episteme, software is taken for theoretical insight and meaning is pushed to the margins. These conditions are strange and challenging, and I hope the reader will see that one way to make sense in a computational episteme to remake meaning is to act as an artist to engage in the software arts. So now you have a general outline of the whole book, and I want to uh, unfold a little more of chapter three on language. And this is where I argue that computers are not information technologies and the operations of computing are not the functions of mathematics. So to um, expand on these assertions, I narrate a history of programming languages that starts in the artisans' workshops of 18th century France. 
my hope is that through this history, the reader will come to understand the huge gap that separates logic and mathematics from computation and the affinity shared between computation and the kind of work that's accomplished in the arts. So let's start with what I call work languages and machine languages. I, defer, I define work language to mean the text and talk employed to describe the processes and products of work. So for instance, one might scrutinize Benjamin Franklin's writings about work, like early to bed and early to rise, make a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, in order to argue that contemporary business practices as inscribed in documents of corporate mission, legal contracts, legislation, employee manuals, and, <clears throat> and so forth, are still tied to Protestant ethics in a variety of ways. And this was, of course, the sociologist Max Weber's uh, project. Each age, each culture, each industry, each economy has one or more work languages. And by examining differences and similarities between these languages, one can interrogate what work is here and now and how it contrasts with work as it is or was there and then. So central to today's work uh, are almost the almost performative qualities of machine languages, work languages employed in the design and analysis of machines. And to adequately describe how a machine works is tantamount to dem demonstrating the work to be done in very exacting detail. When a machine is designed to replace a human in a work process, the actions performed by the human must be translated into a machine language. So the work language of information is a language of calculation developed in the 18th century by a network of enlightenment engineers, scientists, philosophers, economists, and mathematicians, including French mathematician and scientist André-Marie Ampère, Swiss scientist and mathematician Daniel Bernoulli, French engineer and scientist Charles Augustin de Coulomb, German scientist and mathematician Georg Simon Ohm, Italian scientist Alessandro Giuseppe Volta, and Scottish inventor James Watt. Their work language was used to translate the work of men and machines into heat or electrical charge. And thus we have the quantitative measures of the watt, the joule, the coulomb still used today. The French fortifications engineer, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, stated at the beginning of his 1775 treatise what he took to be the fundamental unit of work. He uses this unit to compare the work of machines and the work of men. Quote, we have just seen that the effect of a machine can always be measured according to a weight multiplied the, by the height to which it has been raised. This measure of work, weight multiplied by the height to which it is raised, is still central to contemporary physics and structural engineering. It reduces what might be a set of very complicated movements to a single number labeled with a unit, specifically the unit of foot pounds. The formalization of this language is defined in the unit of work named for the following generations, James Prescott Jewell, an English scientist and beer brewer. By the respective eponymous units, the definition of a jewel relates together many of the participants of the network I listed. One joule, usually written as J, is a unit of work equal to the expenditure of energy necessary to apply one newton, that is to accelerate one kilogram of mass at the rate of one meter per second squared through a distance of one meter. Alternatively, a joule can be defined as passing an electric current of one ampere, that is one coulomb per second, through a resistance of one ohm for one second. Or we can understand a joule to be that heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by 0.24 Kelvin 
a measure of temperature named after the British physicist and engineer Lord Kelvin. This definition can be written as an algebraic equation. And the equation does far more than Coulomb's sentences of 1775. The equation succinctly relates not just weight and height, but also heat and electricity, mechanics, thermodynamics, and electrodynamics. Many of the fluxes and flows investigated independently in the 18th century. So this line of research was continued through the 19th century as thermodynamics with a practical application to, among other things, Joule's business of brewing beer, the construction of steam engines, and eventually internal combustion engines. The unit of one joule divided by Kelvin, that is a measure of work or energy, <coughs> divided by temperature, turned out to be pivotal for the development of thermodynamics. J over K is a unit of entropy, the measure of disorder. So who would have foreseen such a direct connection between work and disorder? Entropy is a measure of the number of ways in which a system may be arranged. That is, its measurement in a system is proportional to the number of possible states of the system. In the middle of the 20th century, Claude Shannon created a, formalist, a formal definition of information based on the definition of entropy. And according to Shannon, entropy is equal to the average amount of information contained in a message. And this we know today as the basis for information theory. Information theory is assumed to be the foundation of information technology. This definition of information signals its origins in the 18th century problem of measuring how much work a common laborer accomplishes lifting and carrying loads at a construction site. So many students who have taken introductory physics have been struck by the absurdity of this work language. Let's imagine you're a house builder's apprentice and your name is Sisyphus. In the morning, your duty is to take the builder's toolbox out of the truck and open it up. The builder climbs up to the second floor of the house under construction, and whenever he calls for a tool, Sisyphus, bring me a hammer. Your job is to get it out of the toolbox, climb up the ladder, give it to him, wait until he finishes the task, and then climb down the ladder again and put the tool back in the toolbox. So according to this definition of work, at the end of the workday, if you've performed your job well and returned all the tools back to the box, you've done no work. You lifted certain weights in the form of tools to certain heights at the top of the ladder. That constitutes work. But you return those same weights back to the toolbox on the ground. And that constitutes negative work. Therefore, the sum total of work completed by you is zero. Poor Sisyphus. So anticipating my conclusions for today, let's look at the plates from Diderot and uh, Encyclopedia depicting the work of artisan pin makers. Do you see men and machines lifting a lot of weight? No, right? So even if the work language of physics and information is the right one for describing coal mining and construction sites. It's not the right one for describing the work of the mechanical arts. In fact, it's absurd when employed in the workshop. So what is the appropriate work language for describing what artisans, designers, and, art, uh, and artists do? There is a second work language developed in the 18th century. And curiously, this history starts at the same place with some of the same people as the history of the jewel. However, the second work language is a language of the arts. And unlike the first language, the second does not ultimately collapse into a single number. Rather, this work language can be employed to describe how work is done and not just its effects. The second language anticipates what we know today as computer languages. So its history is referred to within the discipline of computer science, but rarely told in full. For example, one of the founders of the field of computer science, Herbert Simon, quipped in 1958 that physicists and engineers had little to do with the invention of the digital computer. The real inventor was the economist Adam Smith. So what's Simon referring to? 
Recall that in book one, chapter one, of Adam Smith's best known work, The Wealth of Nations, um, he describes the division of labor. Smith wrote, quote, the greatest improvements in the productive power of labor and the greatest part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is anywhere it directed or applied seem to have been the, uh, the effects of the division of labor. So clearly then, Herbert Simon is suggesting that we examine how work and the division of labor are at the core of the computer. Central to Adam Smith's discussion on the division of labor is an examination of how pins are made. Smith's description, I want to point out, is an entirely different kind of language than, in the, than is used in the first work language I just described. Adam Smith's work language has its beginnings in a set of drawings detailing a workshop producing pins in a little town in Normandy, L'Aigle, France. The engineer Jean Rudolphe Perronnet made his observations at this site, and let's call his observations anachronistically ethnographic analysis so that we can be reminded of the importance of contemporary human scientists, specifically ethnographers, contribution to the design of software and hardware. Trained in civil engineering, mathematics, and mechanics, Perronnet joined the engineering corps of the Pont et Chaussée in 1735. And soon thereafter, he was appointed the chief engineer for the district of Alençon and was primarily concerned with the construction and paving of roads. But during the same period, Perronnet studied the workshops of artisans and craftsmen. He wrote two manuscripts on the manufacture of pins by this workshop in the nearby town of L'Aigle. While neither of these manuscripts was immediately published, Perronnet contributed the entry for pin or pin maker to Diderot and D'Alembert's encyclopedia. Moreover, Perronnet's detailed descriptions of how craftsmen manufactured the pins, how they used their machines, and how the machines were designed anticipated the work language and the machine language of the encyclopedia, a collection that incorporated many articles on contemporary methods of craft and production. So the design historian Antoine Picon discusses the three main terms of this work language of the encyclopedia, gestures, operations, and processes. Picon says the common threads that connect the different, art different articles devoted to the arts and crafts are the description of elementary gestures of production, how these movements are integrated and are thereby Def define aggregate technical operations and the logic of chaining together these operations to form processes organized according to a division of labor. The encyclopedia repeatedly emphasizes the benefits of the division of labor, gestures, operations, processes. This triad was applied to the description of the fabrication of stockings, pins or ropes, the extraction of iron ore and its refinement, the notion of operation occupies a central position in this framework. It is a kind of basic semantic unit that underlies the know-how of individuals and the logic of the entire chain of production, from individual movement to process chain, the thread that weaves them together is analogous to the overall aim of Diderot, D'Alembert, and their encyclopedia collaborators, the integration of all forms of knowledge. So central to the story of the encyclopedia's work language is a set of writings about the division of labor. 19th century analysis of the division of labor moved quickly from the physical industrial labor to mental labor, especially the labor of calculation. After Perronnet, the history continues with Adam Smith's reading of D'Alembert and Diderot's encyclopedia entry for pin making and the description of how pins are made in this workshop in L'Aigle, Normandie. This production of pins illustrates his opening paragraphs on the division of labor in his book, The Wealth of Nations. Then, just a few years later in 1791, Gaspard Prony, charged by the French government to produce a series of enormous and detailed logarithmic and trigonometric tables, borrowed back from Adam Smith this image of the division of labor 
claiming that he could manufacture logarithms as easily as one manufactures pins. Pony organized a great number of working class non-mathematicians to perform as a set of computers to order, uh, in order to calculate the tables. <clears throat> now there is, uh, however, some sort of Oedipal perversity in Pony's claim that he was inspired by Smith, because Smith's source is obviously, ultimately, Diderot, Diderot's encyclopedia. Yet Peronet was not just Pony's professor, mentor, supervisor, and eventual collaborator, but also his predecessor as the first director of the École des Ponts et Chaussées. So Pony succeeded him as director in 1798, and this unlikely detour through Scotland through the writings of Adam Smith that connects the genealogy of computing from Peronet to Pony is the source of computer scientist and Nobel Prize winning economist Herbert Simon's quip that Smith was the inventor of the computer. So a few years after Pony's achievement, British mathematician, philosopher, and engineer Charles Babbage noted how Pony's division of labor could be incorporated as a machine. And in my preferred terms, Babbage thus translated the work language of the encyclopedia into a machine language. And he achieved this in plan, but not in physical form. His analytic engine was too expensive to build and required parts that exceeded the precisions the tools makers of his time could readily make. Nevertheless, even on the drawing board, it became clear that the machine language he forged out of the encyclopedia's work language is from a very different family than, the, than logic or mathematics. The differences appear clearly in Babbage's drawings. Historian Mark Priestley tells us, quote, in the course of his work, Babbage found that the traditional method of using drawings to describe machinery was inadequate. A drawing could only represent the state of a machine at one instant and so provided little assistance in understanding the sequences of movements involved in a complex mechanism or in working out the appropriate timing of the movements and its interacting parts. Consequently, Babbage was driven to invent a new graphical notation for machines that combined textual annotation and the illustration of the structure of the parts of the machine with novel means to describe the succession of movements that were to take place in the machine. In terms of the encyclopedia, Babbage had to work out how to describe gestures, operations, and sequences of movements and operations, that is, processes. So as Picon pointed out, operations were at the semantic foundations of the encyclopedia's work language. And soon after Babbage completed his design, it became clear that operations were central to his machine language too. Ada Lovelace, the English mathematician, elucidated the differences between the operations of Babbage's machines and functions of arithmetic and calculus. And she argued that Babbage's machine would require a new field of research beyond mathematics, a field that she called a science of operations. So because of her writings on Babbage's machine, Lovelace is acknowledged to be the first computer programmer, the first software designer, uh, and for, indeed, key issues she identifies concerning the rendering and execution of operations are still concerns of contemporary computer science. So the first language I described is a language of functions. The second is a language of operations. Research in art and design is an issue of revising and extending operations because art and design is expressed and practiced in a work language of operations and not of mathematical functions. So what's the difference between a function and an operation? One can see in the Oxford English Dictionary that prior to the German philosopher and mathematician uh, Leibniz, the term function was a very general term, meaning, for example, official duties, or the kind of action proper to a person as belonging to a particular class. And this is an expansive term applicable to all kinds of work. After Leibniz, however, a new, more specialized mathematical definition is introduced. 
a variable quantity regarded in its relation to one or more variables in terms of which it may be expressed. And this use of the Latin functio, according to the OED, is due to Leibniz and his associates. Thus the language of work as jewels is a part and parcel with the 18th century movement in engineering and to recast engineering analysis and design into the language of Leibniz and Newton's calculus. <clears throat> Looking to the OED again for the definition of operation, we see that it too was and still is an expansive term applicable to the description of all kinds of work. The exertion of force or influence, working activity, a manner of working, the way in which a thing works. So operation contrasts with function. As Antoine Picon emphasized, one must observe that although quantification and mathematical calculation could be considered as the quintessence of analysis, the analytical method of the encyclopedia could very well remain purely qualitative. In other words, the work language of functions is quantitative, the work language of operations can be purely qualitative. So let's rush this history forward about a century to 1947 when Hermann Goldstein and John von Neumann published Planning and Coding for an electric, uh, Electronic Instrument, um, a text we might read today as the first ever computer programming manual. <clears throat> and Goldstein and von Neumann were trying to um, describe programming for a readership that was completely unfamiliar with this notion, obviously, because no one had been <laughs> programming. Um, and they framed it as a kind of, of translation, except they were, un, they were unsure that translation captured this uh, entirely, the notion of, 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 of rewriting mathematical formulas into the computer language. They said the relation of coded instruction sequence to the mathematically conceived procedure of numerical solution is not a statical one, that of a translation, but highly dynamical. A coded order stands not simply for its present contents at its present location, but more fully for any succession of passages through it. So this, this difference between mathematical notation and computation really preoccupied von Neumann for much of his career. Um, the exposition of von Neumann and Goldstein hinges on their development of the then newest graphical means of diagramming a machine, this, the, pl the flow diagram. And it merits comparison to Babbage's notations and drawings because, um, well, if we peer closely into the core of the computer, we can, I assert, at least metaphorically, we uh, can look back in time to see this small um, pin maker's workshop in 18th century Normandy. But the workshop we see now is empty. When we compare it to these old engravings, the lack of people it is, what, is what's most striking about von Neumann's, but also Babbage's notations. Uh, the picture is at the vanishing point <clears throat> of automation, where all workers have been ejected from the workshop and replaced by machines. <clears throat> so something of the work language of operations was lost when it was translated through the centuries from Peronet to Smith to Pony to Babbage and then to von Neumann and Goldstein. And what was lost in the language was the facility to include people, or more specifically, what was lost in translation was an articulation of the interactions between people and machines. How do we put people back into the picture? How do we rewrite the language of operations to include interactions? So um, I want to tie this back to to object-oriented programming in the sense that um, I think the answers to these questions are both uh, absurdly obvious and insanely difficult. Uh, absurdly obvious because we have entire uh, areas of computer science devoted to, for example, interaction design. And there are some answers to these questions there. Absurdly difficult because um, 
if you can uh, you can win a Turing award with a good answer, as Robin Milner did for his analysis and design of interactions. So. Interaction design and programming language design are both disciplines within the larger field of computing, and it might seem odd that interactions between people and machines are straightforward to address in one discipline and extremely difficult for another. But I, th I think, again, this uh, distinction I'm making between operations and functions is useful to think here. It's, it's a long way from functions to uh, integrating people and a shorter distance from using operations as your basis of thinking to integrating people. <clears throat> so this has been a, this has been a long uh, standing question in object oriented programming. Um, beginning with the similar language of the 1960s, uh, object oriented programming designers have been engaged with interaction design and the analysis of work and labor. And so for example, in their book, the meta interface, the artists and interaction designers, uh, Søren Pold and Christian Andersen explain how the, the pioneer, uh, Christian Nigord, contributed both to object-oriented programming and participatory design. So, and as we know, uh, in the field of object-oriented programming, uh, there have been many elaborated connections with other kinds of design, especially architecture, and uh, especially to the work of architect Christopher Alexander in his design patterns that have been especially strong in canonical texts of this community, like the Gang of Four's design patterns and Gabriel's patterns of software. So um, my book has been written to narrate the long history that entangles the arts and design with the concerns of software and programming language design, and also to advocate for an understanding of software design that emphasizes its strong connections to a wide, wider field of art design and the humanities. And these connections and entanglements make software design stronger and open it to interrogation and experimentation by a more diverse group of people. So, but rather than close with these remarks, I'd like to open the discussion by posing a question to you. As you'll remember, the diagrammatic expression of operations and processes of computing took people out of the picture sometime in the 19th century. Graphically, to address the issue of interaction, we need to put people back into the picture. And from this perspective, the object-oriented programming community's interest in Christopher Alexander's design patterns is perfectly clear. The images in the book are focused on people and human activity. And I taught this book for years at Berkeley and then at my current institution at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, but I believe a close look at Alexander's images opens an aporia for any software designer, actually for any kind of technology designer who, want, who aims to pattern their design after Alexander's for the following reason. When we look closely at Alexander's images, we find a design imaginary that almost entirely devoid of technology. So I, I just chose uh, 30, and I'm just going to go really quickly here, 30 of uh, the images from uh, Alexander's book, illustrating 30 of the patterns. And I'm going to flip quickly and slow down for any that mention technology. Right, so design pattern 110 describes how, just look at the pictures, what, who's in the picture, what's in the picture, is there any technology in the picture is kind of the question here. Uh, pattern 110 describes how to build a main entrance to a home, 11, 111 examines a garden form, 112 is a walkway, 113 is interesting because it does address a technology, specifically the car and the relationships between its garage and the home. But now I'm going to speed forward because, as you will see, none of the next 25 patterns concern technology. And I've not given you an unrepresentative sample of the over 250 patterns of the book. Almost none of them concern technology.
So uh, of the ones I selected, the 30th one here is Farmhouse Kitchen. And that is kind of interesting because rightly it should, should concern technology because technology is packed into the kitchen. Even in 1977 when he did the book, um, it packed uh, the kitchen. But notice Alexander's kitchen contains no refrigerator, no oven, no stove, no toaster, no blender, no microwave oven, not even modern pots and pans, only a fireplace. So this, I think, is enigmatically the, the opposite of the contemporary images of computing that depict neither people nor their activities. Moreover, I'd argue that this is even worse than the 18th century uh, encyclopedia plates because it doesn't include any machines. Um, so my question for you is this. How can we put technology, especially te uh, software technology, into Alexander's images? And if we can't manage to do so, how can they be engaged to address questions concerning technology? Thank you. I think we're slightly short on time, but we do have time for a few questions. And I would just like to ask you, if you want to ask a question for a queue here, because we've only got one mic. So, uh, OK, I guess. Gerardotto, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, James Noble, I've got to think of just your point about Alexander. I mean, the subtitle of that book is Towns Building Construction. That's true. So if you did it on the last 50 patterns, wouldn't all of those ones be about technology? I mean, I think there's ones about making mud bricks and, and building floor slabs and stuff. It's, you know, I, I, I'm doing this uh, as, a, as a provocation in some ways. I'm, I'm not saying it entirely excludes technology, right? Technology, as we know it today, when you say something's technology, that, that was really a um, invention the term itself was sort of an invention of the early 20th century, the, the mid-19th century. Um, so there's lots of stuff. Alan Kay was famous for saying, you know, technology is anything that was uh, invented after you were born. So all this stuff we could say is technology, but it's just uh, very far away from the kind of technology that we're concerned with in software, I think. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think you could say that with the last ones. Thank you for an educational talk. So whenever I um, try to give a talk about the history of programming languages, uh, I never mentioned the, the workshops and, and these workings, not due to the endeavor to issue them, but uh, simply due to unawareness. But I do give two uh, uh, examples always. One is Jacquard looms, which are probably somewhere in your book. And the second one are pianolas, so mechanical pianos, which also could be programmed and so forth. And when I thought about this, there was n then I noticed that there was no mention of not only pianolas, but music at all in your talk. So is it simply due to the shortage of time, or do you think that music does not simply fit into the same list where art and software uh, resides? No, I, uh, I've, I've had uh, long discussions uh, with the computer scientist Jean-Gabriel Ganessier, who endorses the book in the back, about that. He's, he knows a lot about music. I don't know very much about music. So part of it is my ignorance. Uh, but I, I think it's simply that there's different ways of sketching out this, this history. And if I was more knowledgeable about music, uh, that would be more central to the thing. But this, it's, it's, a, it's a whole um, community of thinkers, right, that, that really come up with uh, computation and programming. And it's just a... a uh, an issue of narration, of, of succinctness, in order to focus on some people rather than others. But I, I applaud you for, for narrating it in a different manner. Do you have any other brave souls who want to come over here and ask a question? Well, yeah. So um, if I understand you right, um, the current trend of eliminating object-oriented programming 
in favor of functional programming is removing interaction and people from the picture. Do you predict that as a result? Well, it's it's very difficult. I, I have a I have a great fondness for for both. As I, as I was telling uh, Tom before we started, that one of my uh, professors at undergraduate was Paul Hudak, who was one of these key people in functional programming, and who at the end of his life wrote this wonderful book, the Haskell um, School of Music, that's really, you know, brings it to the arts. And, what? School of Expression. It's real School of Expression, right? It really brings it to the arts. Um, so I, I think what I'm really trying to get people to focus on is this notion of uh, what's the work we want to get done and how can we carefully describe the work that we want to get done. And a lot of that work has to do with uh, interacting with other people or having the machines interact with people. And that's very difficult um, in the formalisms of computing. I think there's an over uh, enthusiastic interest in algorithms right now um, because, at least according to Jonald Knuth, you know, algorithms have inputs and outputs, but you're not supposed to interrupt them and, and say anything to them. And you're certainly not supposed to run things like concurrently and all this other stuff. Um, so, the, you know, most of what we use the computer for isn't uh, aptly characterized according to algorithms. And um, we need to sort of deal with that in some way. I think this community has been dealing with that for a long time. Functional programming, I, I think the, uh, the choice of words um, to make people think that those functions are the same things as what we deal with in algebra or whatever, I think that's, that's an un unfortunate choice of words, but I think they have this, some of the same issues. All right, so I think we'll thank Warren for an inspiring keynote. And there's a quick note from Yanis. If you want to talk to Warren, he's going to be around. So if you have more questions, do come over and uh, you can interact and put more human into the picture. Thank you. So ver two very quick notes. First, today we're going to have a real bottleneck at Lund. So uh, the people responsible for planning it have asked me to